I'm doing really well. How are you? Good. We have uh, already kind of started to dive into a lot of these conversations, um, but obviously we're we're going to get a lot deeper on this stuff. Let's t- let's start off by talking about the thing that I'm most interested in right now, which is the stigma around um, psychedelics in general. Realistically, could you go and give me a little bit of the history on why, at least from your professional opinion, that might be? So I think that, you know, when psychedelics were being abused in the 60s and 70s as a part of the hippie counterculture, there was a lot of negative stigma that got associated with it. And, you know, this is very different than what's happening today. I mean, like, you know, the the medicines weren't being used really therapeutically. It was more of a, a form of escapism back then. And I mean, we can go down rabbit holes and stuff like that. But when Nixon was in office, he went and made all of the compounds, all of the hallucinogens, Schedule One, and that. What is Schedule One, by the way? So the people know. Schedule One basically means that there's no medicinal properties to it, and that's very untrue. And like, there was actually clinical studies done with LSD previous, prior to that where they were using it for AUD or alcohol use disorder. And it was showing amazing efficacy for people. So that right there should have been thrown out the door immediately, but for some reason it got pushed through. So there was no clinical studies that could even be performed with the medicines. The only one that actually made it through was ketamine because Mm -hmm. ketamine schedule three. So (laughs) ketamine is actually the only psychedelic that we have legal access to right now. What was the when did this start becoming a wave? Because obviously, like if we're going on the history lesson, this all started from ancient, ancient, like all of the different psychedelics have ancient ties to them. Specifically, when did you see this start to becoming mainstream where people were using like this was in 1960 that like right before the uh, Vietnam War? So. They were actually doing clinical studies with LSD back in like the, I think it was like the 50s and 60s for AUD. Um, And, you know, way prior to that, I mean, like psychedelics or hallucinogens have been being used for thousands of years in religious ceremonies. I mean, ayahuasca is a great example of that. Indigenous tribes in South America would, you know, perform ceremonies where people would tap into these higher states of consciousness and have spiritual experiences, which was really like the hero's journey. And it was like a rite of passage. Mm-hmm. The Is it true that the CIA was using this for mind control? <laughs> so there was uh, something called the MK Ultra experiments. And, and basically they were, you know, based using LSD 25 to actually like, you know, program people and things like that. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about it. It, it, I I don't know the actual specific details. I do know that some of the documents got released that they were actually, you know, spraying LSD 25 through the uh, air vents and brothels and stuff like that. And actually like giving people LSD without them knowing about it. Why was the CIA and these different intelligence agencies using psychedelics? What, what what value does that have for them specifically? I mean, I guess you can, you know, at certain levels when people are using these kind of compounds like that, you could you could try to program people in a certain way. Hmm. Programming. Interesting. Yeah. So does psychedelics then have certain reprogram? Like, how does that work on the mental circuitry in their mind. So when you actually use psychedelic compounds, and and ketamine is a good example of this one, where it causes new neuroplasticity in the brain. And so basically think of our brain as being like a a ski slope that has, you know, skiers go down the same um, paths over and over and over again. Those are our daily thoughts, our practices. We keep on repeating these same things over and over again. And think of new neuroplasticity as like a new layer of snow going down, and then you actually get to put new tracks into place. What's a simple example of that specifically? Like a simple example of somebody that has like set paths, like what would that look like? So these can even be like thought patterns, you know, depression, anxiety, living in a constant state of fear, you know, frequently obsessing things over and over again, you know, like mental loops that we get caught into. And this is kind of like a control alt delete for that old program. And it allows us to put a new program into place. So like how I 
became aware of psychedelics was in dare class when I was in like the fourth or fifth grade or something like that. And they're going through all the different drugs and, and, and they started talking about like LSD mushrooms and these different compounds. And, and there was a massive, like, Hey, like this is like, if you even touch this stuff, like you, you have the cheese touch basically. And they're just like, it seems as though there's such a massive plan to D almost like take all the good of this away yet we have percocets um oxy oxycotton we have all these massive uh narcotics that are just normal like for instance if you're a, a cancer patient what are they going to do they're going to give you chemotherapy and when they give you chemotherapy they're going to give you anti-anxiety medication which is basically going to just completely like take all the excitement and all the ups and downs out of your life. Um, and they're going to put you on all these other different narcotics that basically just drone you out. Why? Like, why? What is the, that's a big question, but like, I, I just want to get your take on that. So my opinion would be that, you know, psychedelics make you think it, it taps you into these higher states of consciousness where you might have self realizations or learn more about yourself or the universe. And, when you're when you're in a hierarchical society where you know we're being told what to do and how to do it and we're in this program that can be scary for the program to actually break people free of it and listen like i don't think all psychedelic use is positive and i think that people do use them for escapism and for recreational use and stuff like that but you know when you have a controlled setting where you can take a macro dose of psychedelics and have these universal experiences or you know these higher consciousness experiences it really not only gives you the ability to love yourself but it gives you the ability to love other people as well hmm. and you know when we're being shipped off to wars all the time and told to you know kill other people and stuff like that i think that can go against that narrative very strongly and i actually personally believe that that might have been what happened with the whole Vietnam situation and, and Nixon making all of these compounds schedule one. Now, like he made the hallucinogens schedule one, but see, ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic. And so that's another reason why ketamine made it through the cracks is because it, it is an anesthetic. It's not classified as a hallucinogen. So, you know, it, it basically made it through without anybody really, it made it through under the radar, basically. Well, what would be your response to people that are like recreationally doing things like shrooms or LSD or acid or these different like quote unquote party drugs is how people are like framing them? Like what is the, uh, I guess, what is some of the negative things that from your, cause you, you do this in, in a therapeutic way, what are they missing in terms of using them in that way? It's the intention. So listen, like I'm not going to say that, you know, I think that it should be done properly and safely. And now that we have legal access to compounds like ketamine, you know, you can actually go to a clinic and you can do it properly. I, I do have previous psychedelic experience in my life where I didn't do it in a clinic. And, you know, and, and I actually used psychedelics recreationally that wasn't for a therapeutic value. But, you know, we're talking about apples and oranges here when you're really talking about taking people on their healing journey and actually getting, you know, an effective positive outcome from these experiences. If I was going to tell anybody out there that was using these medicines recreationally, I would say be safe and make sure that you're with people that you really trust and that care about you. And I am not condoning or telling anybody that they should recreationally use psychedelics, but I also know like, you know, that do things do happen. And so, you know, set a good intention and, and, and use it for the right reasons. You know, you can uh, achieve amazing things through these experiences when your intention is right and when you're in the right set and setting. And that's another thing that's really important is set and setting, meaning make sure you're somewhere safe. Make mm. sure that you're, you know, not out in public and have to get into a car afterwards or something like that. I mean, like, you know, like these are very powerful compounds and at the right doses, you will not be in this reality anymore. You will be in a completely different reality. And I think that, you know, in a time like right now where we're in this like psychedelic renaissance, 
people need to be really careful because all it takes is one really bad story and it can shift the whole narrative. You know, I tell people all the time, I can give you a million positive psychedelic stories about how it healed veterans and people with substance abuse issues and suicidal people and things like that. But normally that's not what's going to make the headlines. It's going to be an unfortunate situation where somebody takes too much ketamine in a hot tub or something like that, and they end up drowning and dying. And then that's what is plastered everywhere because in a society where they don't want people to know about a lot of the benefits of what's happening because it's getting away from the pharmaceutical paradigm of hey let's treat your symptom and actually get to the root issue and the root cause of why people are suffering to begin with we're talking about you know millions if not billions of dollars being lost and so you know it's it's a very touchy subject and make sure that you're doing it properly speaking on that um the idea that this is an awakening uh the the psychedelic renaissance is is how you put it but i i really couldn't put it in any other better way there's a lot of waking up that's happening right now when do you think that was what, what, what was the catalyst of that like what do you what do you see especially since 2020 and 2019 like when did you see the catalyst of there was a massive cataclysmic shift from, you know, I think there was a belief and, and there still is that we are being controlled and that's no, like, we're not, we're not saying anything, you know, crazy or anything like that, but there is a control level. Some people might believe that COVID-19 was a massive exercise of control to see what they could potentially get away with. Now, just like everything, things are so going way further, farther in the opposite direction of that control. Is this the kind of what you believe is the key to that, taking that control back? Not speculating on whether anything was real or not. I definitely want to say this that you know there's this great analogy that's been used and and it's a, a frog in simmering water okay and if the a frog is in water and the heat just slowly goes up the frog ends up getting cooked all right and if the heat goes up very quickly the frog will jump out of the water and so i guess you could kind of look at 2020 and these you know this synchronistic flow of events that's been happening as the heat flying up very quickly and people may be realizing that certain things that they thought were true might not be so true and people are starting to question a lot of things that are happening which i think is a really good thing for the world and you know i will say this one thing that psychedelic medicines did for me personally is they brought me from living in a place of fear to a place of love, all right? And so I don't focus on things that are, you know, supposed to scare you. I, I, I stay in the solution. I live in the solution these days, and I come from a place to, of love. I do believe that we are like the manifestors of reality and the co-creators of existence, and where my thoughts are focused on manifests in the reality. Mm. So why would I want to sit around and think of things that I would be fearful of when I could think of things that are positive and manifest that into my reality? I call all of these negative thought loops or these fearful places that people go to. It's like the loop. Mm. All right. And it's this loop that we get caught in, you know, and it's this constant state of fear. It's anxiety. It leads to depression, all of these things. And I think personally that psychedelic medicines are a catalyst to break you free from the loop. Interesting that you just said that, because I think I was having a conversation when I was in uh, San Diego about this idea that we're kind of in a position where through this loop that you're talking about that people are in, it, we're in a distraction world. So what do, what do I mean by that? It's social media. Let's take social media as an example. Social media is a distraction. It's a complete distraction. We know this. It, it's there's a great uses, and this is all. All this content is going to go up on social media. So in no way am I demonizing it. But I think what happens is 
we are in a phase where we are constantly being enthralled in distractions. What does distraction do? It takes us further away from self-mastery. What does self-mastery do? Unlocks the ability to see the world as it truly is and puts you in that frame of love versus anxiety and fear. Best example of this was I was in San Diego. I'm on my phone, or I'm not on my phone. I, I, my, my phone was in the room, and I'm like looking out on the um, ocean line. I'm just sitting there, and I'm having a great moment of just like deep introspection. Very rare, because I was in a moment of peace and distractionless. This, um, two helicopters go by. We're in San Diego, so it's like a large military base. I see these two helicopters go by. Immediately, I'm switched into this new mental mental mode. Why are those helicopters out there? What are they doing? Oh my gosh, we're supposedly at war with all these different countries. Wait, what, what, does that mean that, you know, and I just all of a sudden go down this deep, deep, deep rabbit hole. And I'm like, wait a minute. And I just literally felt myself in a moment being like, wait a minute, what was I just, wait, I was just focused on me, the things that I'm going through, all the confusion that I'm personally having, all these types of, that's what it, that's the, that, they don't want you in that phase. They don't, they being whoever, but they don't want you thinking about how can I solve my problems? How can I fix me personally? Why do you think that is? So I call all of that outside noise the chatter. Okay, and I don't pay any attention to any of it. I look at us like biological computers, and at the end of the day, we can be programmed. And so I'm very mindful, even when it comes to social media, of the content that I'm consuming. You know, it's like, is this helping me or is it distracting me? And so I will literally only follow positive you know, pages, I, inspirational things, things like that. I was on the couch the other night and my girl was like, I was listening to the same thing on a loop over and over and over again. It was a clip, right? And she's like, what are you doing? She's like, that's driving me nuts. You're just listening to it over and over again. I'm like, I'm programming myself right now. Mm. I'm going to make sure I don't forget this. I need this in my life. And so if I see anything that's negative on my feed, out of the equation if we manifest our own reality what we focus on manifests right so let's say that the average human being has like ten thousand thoughts a day right and let's say somebody that has an overworking crazy mind like mine has like 20 or thirty thousand thoughts a day what if we could harness all of those thoughts to only focus on like five things all right and just forget everything else five things and then like what happens if you're like super crazy and you could harness it and laser focus on just one that's how you manifest listen when 2020 hit we opened up our clinic like a week before the lockdown okay we did our first treatment like a week before the lockdown it was nuts you know we were an essential business so we didn't have to shut down because we're a medical facility and the world was shutting down and I looked at Christina and I said, don't pay attention to anything, all right? We live in a psychedelic bubble right now. I said, all we're focused on is building this company and helping the next person. That's it. Don't think of anything else. I don't care if UFOs start coming down from the sky or whatever. Don't pay attention to anything. Just keep moving forward. Stay positive. Know that we're doing things for the right reasons. And with the laws of attraction, everything else is going to fall into place. If we're manifesting, stay positive, stay focused on what you want to create, and don't listen to anything else. That is, it sounds super simplistic, but it's actually one of the hardest practices to actually perform on a daily basis because we are so, it, it, what we have fallen into, I'm reading, rereading Atomic Habits, which is a great, great book, but it talks about these ski slopes that you just go down and you're so used to it. What we have in this comfort crisis that we currently sit in, which is just the world of full of comfort, the easiest thing to do is get distracted. And they make it easier day by day by day. Like we're about to have a VR, like we're about to live in an augmented reality world where we can't escape the distractions because that's what they want in, in a real way. Like, or, you know, I don't want to make be too conspiratorial, but it, it would make sense that the way that technological advances are going, there's going to be a merging of 
the distraction, technology, advancement, human advancement, those two merge together. How do you view that? Do you see technology as a force for good or a force for evil? I think it's what you utilize it for, man. I think that everything's divine and it always has been. Mm. And we just have to either use it for the positive or you can use it for the negative. I mean, like the Internet's a great example of this. It's like, are you using this to expand your consciousness and learn things? Or are you sitting on Pornhub all day? You know, it's like you have to be mindful. And I think that when it comes to this sense of like self-mastery or, or how to avoid all of that chatter or these negative aspects of things, meditation is the answer, man. You know, bringing yourself back to the present moment where everything's perfect and it always has been. One day I was having a conversation with somebody before they were getting ready to embark on their first ketamine journey. And I'd said it hundreds of times to people where it's like any anxiety that you have going into this is going to go away very quickly once you receive the medicine because it's an anesthetic. So people usually get very comfortable and they're like, oh, okay, I feel really good right now. And that's when you close your eyes lay your head back, and pretend like you're going to take a nap. If you find yourself overthinking, go always go back to your breath. Take a big, deep breath in through the nose, out through the mouth, and bring yourself back to the present moment where everything's perfect and it always has been. And so after I was walking away from that person, I stopped dead in my stance, and I was like, holy crap, I'm not talking about ketamine treatments. I'm talking about life. And so now, throughout my days, if I ever catch myself in a thought loop or if something gets kind of heavy, I take a big deep breath in through the nose, out through the mouth, and bring myself back to the present moment where everything's perfect and it always has been. So that's actually a good example of like why I think ice bath um, and, and the like cold immersion is becoming what it's becoming in this um, phase is because... I was, I was having this conversation with the founder of Edge Theory Labs, which is a, a ice bath company. And he was talking about that idea of really all we need to do to solve a lot of our problems is just take a deep breath and realize we're, this is a part of the human experience. This is, we're, we're just living, you know, we're, we're, all we have is right here, this present moment. And ice bath is a great example of a extremely intense outside stimulus and the practice is settling yourself in that pressure cooker, basically. You get in cold water, you're shivering, your body is actually having crazy responses. And think about stress. Think about all these things that happen in our outside world. It's the same, it's the same environment as going into cold water. It's hard. It's scary. You're not sure if you're going to like, you don't know how long you can handle whatever the stimulus is, but it all comes back to breath specifically going deeper into that one of the things that me and you have talked about because i have been somebody that has been not well researched in the psychedelic space at all i've been very curious but because of the stigmas that are out there i've always kind of gone eh, maybe maybe may, maybe i'll go down this route later down the road we had a conversation the other day about entrepreneurs in this and, and the psychedelic experience i asked you kind of straight up my worry and most high-level entrepreneurs are worried that it's going to take away their drive. Because if we think about it, this so so it's, at least my understanding is this reduces your ego. This takes you out of an ego mindset. This takes basically removes the ego from the equation. If you remove the ego from most business owners, most high-level entrepreneurs right this second, chances are most of them are going to radically reduce their productivity. What is your response to that? I think that there's different levels of ego, okay? Mm. And I think that ego can be a driver, but I think that there's also different levels of ego where it's like a toxic ego. So like arrogance is a toxic form of ego, while confidence is a very positive form of ego. And... I think when people have these profound psychedelic experiences and go through an ego death like people have heard about, it's not going to take your drive away. It, it actually it takes the arrogance out of the equation and it makes you more confident in your being. You know, listen, like 
I wouldn't be the businessman that I am today if it wasn't for my psychedelic experiences, okay? It brought me to a cool, calm, centered, and collected place. And I think that one of the most important aspects about being an entrepreneur is being able to operate in chaos, Mm. okay? And I can actually be that calm now and operate from a good mental standpoint because of my therapeutic experiences from psychedelics. Also, psychedelic experiences, and especially with ketamine, can actually increase your natural dopamine levels, which is our feel-good chemical. It's what motivates us to do positive things in our life. So you actually have higher dopamine levels, which is going to make you want to go out and, and chase after your dreams. You know, and if I am the manifester of my own reality and we are the co-creators of existence, my outer world is a direct reflection of my inner world. And I think that a, like a loop that a lot of entrepreneurs get caught in, because I have been there, is that I need to go fix this. I need to go fix this. I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off because I think that if I go and do this and this and this and this, that everything's going to fall into place. But it's not an outside job. It's an inside job. This is where meditation kicks in. So as I go deep within and I do all of the healing that needs to happen, it reflects and manifests into my outer world. Great example of this is uh, we had an end-of-year review um, in December about the company. And as the CEO um, and one of the co-founders, I was looking at our company and you know, there's always problems with companies. There's always things that you could do, improve on. And I looked at it and I go, okay, our biggest issues is like these five things. If I went and looked at myself personally, I could attribute most of the things that are wrong inside the company being wrong with me personally. Disorganization, conflict resolution, all these problems that are easy to solve, but they're not a company problem. They're a personal problem. So when you're talking about entrepreneurs, I think most entrepreneurs are in the self-development zone of thinking. They're very much like trying to pursue a better version of themselves. When you think about something that is represented as a hard reset, I think that scares people because they're worried that if they hard reset, all the work, all the motivation they currently feel towards the thing that they're pursuing might change. My opinion on it is if it does radically change from an experience like that, chances are you weren't motivated by the right things. Do you see that? You know, when we're, when we're talking about this hard reset that happens, think of it as taking all of the negative aspects out of your life. Like, it's not going to take your good qualities away. It's not going to take your drive away. It literally is going to help you heal through the things that were holding you back. You know, and like... I have guys that run $100 million companies that come in and tap into higher states of consciousness and they're coming out of their journeys and they're journaling down business ideas and starting new companies because of it. You know, listen, like there's a lot of movers and shakers out there that use psychedelics to propel forward. You know, Steve Jobs is a good example. Elon Musk has went public and talked about using ketamine and MDMA. You know, I think that when used properly and channeled, you know, this can tap you into places where you can retrieve information from the universe and come back and utilize it. I know this is actually very true because I personally did this in my psychedelic journey. Hence, one of the reasons why I believe that everything is manifested the way that I could. We're also talking about like people use very small amounts of their brain on a day to day basis. When we're sitting here having this conversation, we're using a minuscule percentage of our brain. You know, it's like what, 5% or something? They did a clinical study on different hallucinogens or psychedelic compounds and they actually monitored brain activity on people. They gave people psilocybin mushrooms and it activated like 10% of the brain that we're not normally using. They gave people LSD it activated like 65% of the brain that we're not using. And then they gave people ketamine. And ketamine lit up over 85% of the brain like a Christmas tree. It was like whoosh. And so I believe that this is us using dormant parts of our brain, tapping into higher states of consciousness, and being able to retrieve universal information that we can apply to our lives and do amazing things. Mm. So then when you you think about 
that tapping into like tapping into that new consciousness when you're talking about these high level entrepreneurs what is the so what would be your kind of pitch to them especially if they're crushing it and they have all these positive things positive momentum going on in their life what's your pitch to them on why they should even think about this as a potential route to personal development in a level that can't be achieved because before you go into that what i was going to say is a lot of what you've talked about with me is the overhauling of bad habits it's a great representation of what this hard reset will do for you some people have already manually reframed some of their habits like myself personally like you can do that it's a arduous process but you can do it for the you know successful entrepreneur what it if let's say they have a good habits established, let's say they have good practices, what do you think that next level is? Flow state. Getting into a constant state of flow state where you're taking like the whole thought process out of the equation almost. It's just flowing. It's happening. And for people that are already in a state of flow, it's going to increase that and turn your flow state onto like flow state on steroids, mm -hmm. you know? And like you know this is going to sound crazy to some people i get it but i truly believe that we're vibrational beings okay and if you are going to raise your vibration which is what i believe that the whole like point of our existence here is to like be of service and raise our vibration so we can get in alignment when you do psychedelic therapy it literally will raise your vibrational level and put you into alignment with other people that are on the same frequencies that you're at, right? So you'll start meeting the right people at the right time. Things will fall into place. It's literally like you've been leveled up. And and that's what I actually look at psychedelic therapy as is it's a level up. You know, it's like this is going to take you to the next level of your life that you've been trying to achieve. And, and if you feel stuck, like you've been trying to achieve it and you just can't attain it, this is actually going to push you on to that next level. So then when you, uh, when you think about the, the transition for most people from going from a state of like, this is a crazy, like craziness that we're talking about to, this is something that I want to perform. The thing that I wanted to touch on was how is this connected with religion? And in your opinion, how, how because we've had the conversation and I, as a very uh, testosterone filled young 24 year old, we will have some of the conversations about the work that you're doing and I'll get angry. I'll be like, why are people fighting against this? What, like, why, why is, why are we in this war in terms of what feels like good and evil? And you had a very interesting perspective on that when I brought that to your attention. What, why, why, do, why is there so much evil in the world, and how is this connected in your mind to religion and spirituality? So, during a macro dose psychedelic experience, meaning like this is when you have a complete out of body experience, or you you know have a divine or spiritual experience. I had an experience where. I became one with everyone and everything. And then I became one with God. And then I realized that we were all a part of it, whether you want to call it God or consciousness or the universe, that we're all it. We break ourselves down into the droplets of water in the ocean of consciousness and put ourselves to sleep to forget who we truly are so we can experience the experience of life. And that can be very scary towards religious, religious organizations, which basically are putting these dogmatic beliefs on people and hurting people like sheep at the end of the day. You know, I, I definitely believe that, and this isn't me saying this, you know, I've, I've heard quotes from, from a lot of people in the psychedelic field that I respect, but it's like psychedelic compounds take the middleman out of the equation. Mm -hmm. I don't need anybody else to be in contact with the divine. You know, you take these compounds and you have these spiritual experiences and you realize that, you know, that we're all a part of this, that separation is an illusion. I am the I am and so are you. We're all it. So that also can be scary because then if you realize all of that, you're pretty hard to control at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. See, what psychedelics did for me once I had that realization is, well, if we're all it, then I guess I can do anything that I want, can't I? I guess I can manifest anything that I want. And so 
the only limitations that I have are the ones that I place upon myself. When we manifest our own reality, there's this, you know, there's this philosophy. It's this old hermetic philosophy. And that's like, you know, like everything's mental. Okay. That this is a manifestation of the collective mind of God. It's like God's dream basically. And so if we're all part of it, well, then we can manifest anything we want. We put a polarity out into the universe, meaning that we actually, like, we think it, okay? And we put it out there. And then now it's going to start manifesting, but now it's boot camp time. Mm. Now now you're going to have to start jumping through hoops. It's because we're not ready to receive the manifestation yet. We have to be evolved into the person that can actually receive the manifestation. Because if I get it too quickly, I'm just going to waste it away. I'm not going to be able to keep it or attain it. And so the thing is, is that this is when people start having trials and tribulations. This is when things start getting tough. And then this is when people quit. Mm. They're like, oh, man, life's unfair. This is so awful. You know, listen, like we opened up our clinic a week before the lockdown and we were doing physical therapy at that time. And then three weeks later a G wagon drove through our building because a guy had a stroke like years ago and his foot got jammed when he was getting into his car and he drove his Mercedes through the side of our wall into our building and everybody's freaking out. And some people would be like, Oh, this is a sign. Like we we're not supposed to do this. It's unfair. This isn't supposed to happen. And I'm like, no, this is a test. This is a test. We just keep going. We stay positive. We use the laws of attraction. We keep moving forward. And, you know, as long as you just keep doing that and never give up, you can do whatever you want. We can manifest anything that we want. There's this picture that goes to my mind all the time, and it's like this guy with a pickaxe, right? And he's going through this cave, and he's picking away and picking away and picking away, and he gets way down this tunnel, and he's like, ah, oh, I'm never going to get anything, and he throws his pickaxe on the ground, and he, like, walks out, and if he would have just hit the wall one more time, there was an entire wall full of diamonds mm. It's like, but the only way that we're going to get to those diamonds is if we never, ever give up. And so that's my message. And that's the, so what you just said was really powerful there. Cause I think there's a misnomer when it comes to manifestation that you can just say a bunch of positive things and, and become them. It's, it's not that simple because for instance, if I sat here and said, I want to build a hundred million dollar company, I'm going to build a hundred million dollar company. That is what I'm going to do. And I repeated that to myself every single day day on it. If I am not confirming that manifestation with the evidence of what I do in my day-to-day -day life, which is what people miss, people say manifestation, that's great. Okay, I'm going to wake up every day. I'm going to read this mantra 10 times over, right? But then when I start my day, I'm not going to represent somebody that is due to have a $100 million company. What does my day look like? What do my habits look like? What do all these processes in my life, what does my process reflect? of somebody that's doing that. So it's like, there's a little bit of a disconnect that most people think it's like, oh, manifestation doesn't work. I, I, I said, I'm happy all the time. And I never became happy. Well, what do your habits look like? And that's something that we talked about as well. It's like, uh, the psychedelic experience is very, very powerful, but it doesn't fix. It doesn't solve the problem that really most people need to solve, which is what does your process look like? How, but you, you guys actually, this is a part of your guys, this therapeutic, um, this is what you guys adjust your therapy to reflect. How does that, how do you guys kind of match the habits with the manifestation and the medicine? Listen, I want to say one thing before we get there is that the universe doesn't respond to what you say. The universe responds to who you are. Okay. So you can sit here and talk a good talk. I mean, I know tons of people that do it, but without being genuine and without putting action behind this manifestation, nothing's going to come to fruition, you know? And so, and, and now back to what your question was, is that psychedelics are just the catalyst. It's just a tool. Like people think that psychedelics are the end all answer. It's like, no, this is actually the beginning of the journey. All right. Let's get you to grab the reins of your own, like grab the reins of your own life. Let's get rid of the symptoms of depression, anxiety, PTSD, or whatever the symptoms are. Or like, let's just like get you to a place where you're ready to embark on this better journey of life. 
But now it's about healthy lifestyle practices, meditation, breath work, going to the gym, eating all organic, non-GMO, drinking natural spring waters, hitting the sauna. I mean, like these are all things that I practice in my daily life. Psychedelic medicines gave me the ability to love myself enough to actually want to do those things. For years of my life, I hated myself. I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror, and it was hard for me to do much of anything except for sit around and get stoned all day or whatever I was going to do. Once I found that overwhelmingly loving feeling for myself, I was like, okay, time to take the reins. I'm going to start going to the gym. I'm going to start meditating. I'm going to start doing all of those things. And then that's when the big shift happened. Mm. That's when life started getting better and better because... You know, you can have all of this knowledge and you can be aware of everything, but without action, nothing is going to start moving forward. Yeah, it's interesting because when we go back to the self-mastery conversation, it's very hard for you to master yourself if you don't even want to understand yourself. So it's like I have fallen into a trap before when I look at previous mistakes that I've made and I've beat myself up more for the... I'll I'll reframe that actually because... We all feel emotions, but what happens is the judgment on the emotions that we're feeling is what caused the true unrest in our bodies. So if I feel, let's say I feel a feeling of jealousy, which is normal. Everybody feels some feeling of jealousy. They see somebody at work crushing it better than they are, and you feel this tinge of jealousy. Now, there's two ways that you can do that. You can view that jealousy as a feeling that is a almost like you're an observer of it. My favorite thing that ever happened was when I became an observer of my feelings and not a owner of my feelings. I am not my feelings. My feelings are just that. They're feeling and they, they'll come in the door and they'll come out the door all the same. But the judgment on that feeling specifically is where that happens. How have you seen that play out, especially with all the people that you've treated? So what I, I, I want to say is this. When you are manifesting, your thoughts and your feelings create this like field that emits out of you. And so it's going to determine a lot of what's attracted into your life. And I'm not going to be able to manifest the life of my dreams until I celebrate your victories. Okay? Because if we're all one consciousness, and I am you, and you are me, and we are one at the end of the day, if I see something that triggers me inside of you, it's normally something that I need to work on in myself. And if I see you celebrating some sort of achievement that you've accomplished, that's only one step away from me. But the only thing that might be blocking it is me hating on you. Mm. So the fact is, is that I need to use this to ignite that flame and fire within myself and start working my butt off so I can achieve my manifestations and so I can attract what's meant for me into my life. You have things that put you in flow state and then you have things that are blocks and jealousy, envy, hatred, all of these things are blocks in the energetic field. So we need to observe without judgment or for inspiration and remember that the answer is always love that and that's the truth so like i think about emotions and feelings as they really are like fires they're they're fires that light you up and so many times in my life personally i would have a negative feeling or i would make a mistake or i would do something that i wasn't proud of and instead of looking at that and assessing it, being aware of it. One of the, my favorite things that I, I had a conversation with my girlfriend literally this weekend, I was having all these moments of what I felt were despair. I was having feelings of hopelessness. I was having feel, feelings of jealousy. I was having feelings of anxiety. I'm having all these feelings. Instead of letting that simmer and distract myself and try to throw myself into all these different distractions, consumption, um, you know, again, l- judging those emotions, I just needed to express them. I went to, I went to my girlfriend and I said, here's what I'm feeling. I'm not this. And then I was writing in my journal too. I was like, I am not this feeling, but this is what I'm feeling. Why am I feeling that? What is the root cause of this feeling? Oh, realistically, like you just feel this way because you didn't put in the effort to get what you, that this person got The reality is you didn't put in the time and effort. So why can you expect that fate for yourself if you didn't put in the same amount of effort? And it was just back and forth. Did I solve the problem immediately? Of course not. Did I still feel that feeling? Yeah. But the awareness of it was like the step one to even being accepting over the fact that this is just where I'm at right now. How do you 
be okay with where you are, what you are feeling in the moment, but be, but be able to transition into something greater. Just know that everything, nothing is permanent, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that like, what we have to realize is that abundance is everywhere. And so your manifestations doesn't take away from my manifestations. Whatever your dreams that you're manifesting are and you accomplishing it doesn't mean that mine aren't going to happen. It means that it just hasn't happened yet, you know? And I think that if we get too locked in to what hasn't happened, we're fighting away what is going to happen, you know? And I also know that, like, my thoughts aren't my thoughts, Okay, these are things, like you said, just the things that I'm observing and watching pass through. And that sometimes these repetitive loops that we get put into like this, it's a test. Okay, it's like, oh, this is normally when I'd self-sabotage or something because it's never going to happen and this and that or whatever. And it's like, no, that's when you push harder and, and keep on going. And from my personal experience... When we're getting ready to level up and go to like the next tier of the pyramid, basically, that's when this is going to happen the most. It's like going to be this like huge test of like, you know, like, oh, it's self-doubt. And this is more normally when I'd self-sabotage and like, oh, man, my mind's telling me that this is never going to happen. It's usually right around the corner. But this is when people throw in the towel and they're like, you know what? I give up. Just never give up. Just keep moving forward. And what you are manifesting and what you are trying to achieve in your life will end up happening. You know, I had a guy who I was working with not long ago, and I kept telling him I was going to work with somebody, okay? And I can't say who the person is that I wanted to work with or that I knew I was going to work with, but I knew it would manifest. And it's like, you know, it was an outlandish dream for some people because this guy is like, you know, incredibly successful and famous and stuff like that. And I kept telling the guy, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. He's like, listen, man, he's like, I need you to come back down to reality. Okay. Because like you, what you're talking about is crazy. And I'm like, listen, man, I go, you're putting limitations on your manifestation abilities. I go, don't do that. That's self-doubt. I'm not doubting anything. I already know it's happening. I know it's going to happen. And the guy ended up he, he was like, listen, I've listened to Tony Robbins and I studied the secret and the laws of attraction and all this and everything. Cause like, you know, the secret plays a big role in my life. And I was telling him about manifestation and he's like, it doesn't, it just doesn't work like that. And I'm like, that's why it's not working for you because you are already doubting it. You're putting that energy out. Like it's not going to happen. And so the guy ended up quitting. I don't work with him anymore. I was too outside the box. I was too much of a dreamer. And then recently in my life, I've connected with the person I told him I was going to end up working with. And, you know, we're becoming good friends and like stuff like that. And it's like, I knew it was going to happen, but like, I wasn't going to put the limitations upon myself. When we were embarking on setting up the clinic, Christina's father or stepdad, he sat down with me. You know, we we have a son who's four years old now, four and a half years old. He was like six months old at the time, and which was scary for everybody because we took this leap of faith. And he looks at me and he's like, hey, Charles, he's like, listen, man, if this doesn't work, what's your plan B? And I looked at him and I'm like, nah, man, there is no plan B. And he's like, no, no, no. Like, I get it. But like, but what is your plan B if this doesn't work? And I was like, you don't know how manifestation works. I was like, there is no plan B. I was like, I'm either going to make this happen or I'm going to die trying. I was like, there's nothing else. And now, four years later, we've built a company that's, you know, treated over a thousand people. We're getting people off all their pharmaceutical medications. I've become somewhat of a national spokesperson for the psychedelic movement. Um, We're getting, you know, national recognition for being a clinic that does it safe. And this was all started by two people that had no medical background and that everybody thought was going to fail, but like failing wasn't an option. You just got to keep going. So there's a stoic principle that talks about being comfortable with the worst case scenario. Um, and accepting it and almost living it as if it happened so that way when it does come it's not it's not as big of uh it it doesn't hurt as bad so it's like being comfortable with the worst case scenario right how would you in and that 
somewhat kind of uh, contradicts what we're talking about right now. How would you, um, do you believe that there is a need for being okay with the worst case scenario or is it like, how do you view that? I think that everything happens exactly the way that it's supposed to for my greatest good. And that's the level of stoicism that you have to be at. Listen, if something doesn't play out the way that I see it playing out, it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. It just means it's going to happen in a better way. Mm. You know, like like it's it's molding me into the person that I need to be in order to have the life of my dreams. And so, you know, I've had things in the last four years that were the biggest curveballs you could ever imagine thrown at you. And you've got to get to a level of going through the ringer and getting your butt whooped and go, thank you. Mm. Thank you for kicking my butt like that because now I'm that much stronger. And when it does hit, I'm going to be able to handle it better. And so being in a place of not believing, but knowing that this is the synchronistic flow of the evolution of the person that I'm becoming, and everything in life is either a lesson or a blessing, and sometimes both at the end of the day, but everything's happening t- to me, or not to me, sorry, not everything isn't happening to me, it's happening for me. Mm. And the funny thing about that is pretty much everything that happen- has happened in my life has been a version, it it all depended on how I viewed it. So for an example, um, my dad, when I was 15, he ended up passing away. Me and my dad didn't have a great relationship. He was never really around. And I remember that when that happened, it was such a stark realization of, holy cow, this whole viewpoint of, I always told myself like, oh, I'll build a relationship with him one day. I'll do this one day. I'll do, and I basically made all these excuses And I dealt with this moment of when he passed and I was like, why? And it was a, it was the first moment in my life that I could have really let myself fall down the rabbit hole of life is unfair. Why would this happen to me? Like basically framing wise, positioning wise, I could have positioned it in a way that just, it was, it was my undoing. I could have, like, it was a real reality for me to be like, I'm 15. I'm lost. I like I barely know myself in general and now I lost the direct bloodline of somebody that has all these answers for me. And I don't know what did it, but one day I go, no, this is what needed to happen. I said this needed to happen in my life because now and then all of a sudden I was reframing it. Because now I feel I don't feel that sense of abandonment that I always felt when he was on earth. We were never going to make that relationship work. I knew that internally even at 15 years old. I knew that relationship was never going to work. Now I don't have to stress about it anymore. Now I don't have to let this hold me down and be a reason that I can't be the person that I want to become because my dad don't won't, you know, spend time with me or whatever. But people are going to hear that and they're going to be like, that's so fucked up that you think that your dad, you know what I mean? It, it was all in God's purpose that your dad passed away. And I was like, no, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. Because if it didn't happen, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. So therefore, it is working for me. But the only way that happened and the only line in the sand is how I perceived it. Not how everybody else around me or people were trying to make me perceive it. It was how I perceived it. So I can relate to what you're saying in a lot of ways. You know, my dad died when I was six. And my dad was like an old school Sicilian gangster. You know what I'm saying? That's all. And so the thing is, is that... I didn't learn a lot of the things I probably would have learned in life from him, probably for a better reason, Hmm. okay? And then when he did end up passing away, I ended up escaping a lot of years with different substances and things like that, and my life was a train wreck for a long time. And the fact is, is that if I wouldn't have went through all of those things, then I wouldn't have healed with psychedelic medicines, And then I wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation with you and having a clinic that's helping, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people get off their pharmaceutical medications. And now because of my trials and tribulations, I get to relate to all of those people that were helping because I've been through a lot of the things that they've been through. And so this is the synchronistic flow of the evolution of consciousness or who we are, who we're becoming. And it's like everything serves its purpose. 
a lot of times we just don't know why it's happening when it's happening. And this is when we get this, you know, like, why me? Why is this happening? This is so unfair. And then once you get down the road far enough and you turn that situation into something positive, you have that aha moment. And you're like, oh, that's why that happened to me. I get it. And now that I have a four-year-old son who's, you know, coming up more towards five years old, I'm the best father to him that I ever could have imagined being. I live every single day with him to the fullest. And like, if he asks me to do something that I don't feel like doing, like go play in his room and sit on the floor and play with cars or whatever, because I'm busy, I make time and I do it because I know how hard it was growing up without a father. And I get to put myself into his shoes and be like, well, like, you know, if something, you know, I would want to make sure I did everything I could on a daily basis to be the best father that I could possibly imagine because time isn't promised at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so it literally gave me the ability to be the best father ever that I think I could be for my kid. And that's the, that's the part of, um, when we manifest this idea of doing something great in the world, I don't think most people understand what that requires. Greatness does not come through rainbows and comfort, and it's 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 an like we we uh, we we joke about it all the time. It's like we we named our company Grit Media. Grit Media. Grit has been the precipice of my entire life, which is basically saying, in spite of adversity, fear, anxiety, you are connected to your passion enough that you persevere anyways. So if you label your company and my my whole life is represented in this thing why would i expect my life to be any easier easy times make soft people man goggins talks about it you know he's like i studied the dark you know and it's like that's literally where i'm at it's like i went through some really dark times in my life and when I was going through them, I'm like, why me? God, how come you hate me so much? How come I can't get through all of this? Like, what's going on with me? I just want to be like everybody else. Okay? And now I look back at those times because I studied in the dark too. And I'm like, thank you. Those were my greatest times, man, now that I've made it through them. Because I am a warrior because of that. I fought battles that most people would have given up on. And, and died away, and I just kept going and pushing through them, and now it gives me the ability to be of service and be there for other people that are going through trials and tribulations that I once went through and be a light at the end of the tunnel for them and be like, hey, man, if I made it out, you can make it out too. And so it's like my darkest days gave me my purpose, and my purpose is to be of service and let other people know that they don't have to suffer anymore, that there is an option, and that the only thing that's going to stop them from getting to the place where they want to be is if they give up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting perspective to believe, and what, what I believe wholeheartedly is that without pain, there is no triumph. Without, without hard times, there are no good times because we don't have the perspective. We don't know what a good day feels like if you haven't gone through a lot of bad days. We don't know what it feels like to feel good if we felt bad for most of our life. It's like these things are required and somehow we still run from them and we still give up. And I've been somebody that's given up. I've, I've been in that. I remember what it's like to sit there and be like, ah, why would I do this? The, the world's working against me. This isn't the time. This isn't what I'm supposed to do. This is, and I obviously have to, you know, accept that that was what I, the decision that I made so that I could move forward in my life. But like, I know what it feels like to give up. I know what that feeling feels like. And there is no feeling more hopeless than the feeling of giving up. Diamonds are made under pressure in time, man. Mm. You know? And it's like, listen, I'm not trying to get religious because I'm not, but like, look at Jesus. <laughs> you know, it's like, that was some seriously rough stuff, man. Best-selling author of all, the best-selling story of all time came through the most painful crucifixion somebody could the hard one of the hardest lives that somebody could go through is the best story ever told. Awakening comes from suffering. Okay? And so it's like 
you've got to embrace the suck, man. You just keep going, bro. You know, and just know that once you get out of it, you're going to be one bad MF, man. That And that actually leads me into a great point when we're talking about psychedelics. Some people can think that this is just the drug that fixes all. All of a sudden, you don't feel pain. You don't feel suffering. You don't go through bad times. What would your, be your response to that? <laughs> a breakthrough experience on psychedelics can be one of the most horrible feelings that you've ever been through in your entire life because all of a sudden, instantly, you are unloading all of your pent-up stuff from your entire life. It is not for weak people it is a hero's journey and like you know you can hear stories about the rainbows and unicorns or whatever these you know beautiful psychedelic experiences are which i had plenty of those <laughs> or you can have the ones where you literally go to your own personal hell and have to realize that a lot of the things that you're doing in your life are probably going to end you there if you don't fix them and, you know, and actually having to take that hard, honest look at yourself and say, you know what, I need to stop doing that or I need to stop being this way to people and treating people like this or taking things for granted. Listen, I don't take psychedelics anymore and and I haven't for years now, but my last experience was like after Charlie was born and we were getting the clinic going and I had an experience where I died. Okay. Yeah. And it was like, I went out into the universe and I was in the abyss and I was just like, oh man, I died. You know, it's like I got a family and I've got a son and a beautiful woman in my life and this company that's helping people heal. And I took the medicine and I died. It's like, oh man. And it was like shattering. Like all of these things that I never thought that I would have in my life, all of these accomplishments that I had just made and I, and I died. And then I was like, I would give anything to get it back. I would give anything to get it back. And I'm back in my body and I realized that I was taking everything that I had that I really loved and cared about in my life for granted. And it got me hyper-focused on what was important, my family, my business, and my health. And that's how you go from those 10,000 thoughts that are scattered over a hundred different things to focusing on the main things that truly move the needle. All of the other stuff's just chatter, man. We got to get hyper focused, hyper focused. And, you know, we have to be, we have to be like on this cycle of repeat basically where it's like, it's very composed. You know, listen, I got a, I got a guy and he's a conscious coach. Okay. He's a friend. And he coaches like a bunch of billionaires. And I was like, what, like, what, like, what's the most consistent thing that you see between all of these people? And he's like, they do the same thing every single day, every single day. Their life's on repeat. They, they, it, their schedule's laid out. It's like they wake up, they do this, they go to the gym, they work from this time, they do this. And it's like, and their life is just on repeat. And with time and consistency, we can manifest anything that we want. Well, I could not find a better ending than that one right there. Um, we're going to be doing this many, many times in the future. I learned a ton. I hope you guys did too. Um, if you did, make sure you guys go check Charles out on social media. What are your socials? Charles Patty on Facebook, Charles underscore Patty underscore official on Instagram. You can go check us out at My Self Wellness, or you can go to our website at MySelfWellness.com. Thank you guys again. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, all that type of stuff. We are going to continue to deliver content exactly like this for you guys to help you awaken from the trap of modern society. Thank you.